Now we come to another sutta, which is quite a good and important sutta. The Buddha said, Monks, these four good thoroughbred steeds are found existing in the world. What for? In this case, monks, we have a certain good thoroughbred steed, which at the very sight of the shadow of the goat stick is stirred, feels agitation, thinking, What task, I wonder, will the trainer set me today? What return can I make him? Here, monks, we have such a steed, and this is the first sort of good thoroughbred steed found existing in the world. I just stop here to explain eh, about the this this the 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 best type of a horse eh, is the one when the trainer comes eh, and he sees the 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 sight of the shadow of the goat stick. Eh, he feels agitated. He stirred to action. What is this goat stick? This goat stick eh, is one. Uh, it's like a sharp instrument uh, to prick the horse. Uh. Sometimes the horse is stubborn, uh, he won't listen. Uh. So you have this sharp instrument, uh, you prick prick his skin. Uh, sometimes can prick deeper. Uh. So uh, that is the goat stick. Uh. Then the Buddha said, uh, Then again, monks, we may have a certain good thoroughbred steed which is not stirred at the mere sight of the goat stick, feels no agitation, but when his coat is pricked with the goat, he is stirred feels agitation, thinking, what does I wonder, will the trainer set me today, etc. This is the second sort of good thoroughbred steed. Then again, monks, we may have a certain good thoroughbred steed which is not stirred at the sight of the goat stick, nor yet when his coat is pricked with a goat, but when his flesh is pierced, he is stirred, he feels agitation, thinking, what task, I wonder, will the trainer set me today, etc. This is the third sort of good thoroughbred steed. Once more, monks, we may have a good thoroughbred steed which is not stirred, feels no agitation at the sight of the goat stick, or when his coat is pricked, or yet when his flesh is pierced with the goat stick. But when he is pierced to the very bone, he is stirred, feels agitation, thinking, what task, I wonder, will the trainer set me today? What return can I make him? Here we have such a good thoroughbred steed. This is the fourth sort of good thoroughbred steed. Thus, monks, these four good thoroughbred, thoroughbred steeds are found existing in the world. I'll just stop here for a while eh, to recapitulate. These are the four types of good horses. Eh. The first one, he sees the, the, the owner, uh, the trainer eh, coming eh, with the goat stick. Eh, or just the sight of the shadow of the goat stick is enough to stir him uh, into action. The second one, he has to, when the trainer comes with the goat stick, he's, he's not stirred, but the trainer has to poke him, uh, poke him, then he goes into action. The third one, you poke him, also not enough. You have to poke until the flesh is pierced, uh, then he'll go into action. The, the fourth one, even that is not enough, but he has to be pierced uh, until the goat uh, goes into the bone, uh, then only he'll get into action. So these are the four good uh, thoroughbred steeds. Huh? Then the Buddha said, Just in the same way, monks, these four good thoroughbred men are found existing in the world. What for? In this case, monks, here we may have a certain good thoroughbred man who hears it said that in such and such a village or town is a woman or a man afflicted or dead. That means sick huh? or dead. Thereat he is stirred, he feels agitation. Thus agitated, he strictly applies himself. Thus applied, he both realizes in his own person the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Just as monks, that good thoroughbred steed on seeing the shadow of the goat stick is stirred, feels agitation. Even so, using this figure, do I speak of this good thoroughbred man. Such in this case is the good thoroughbred man. Again, monks, here we may have a good thoroughbred man who does not hear it said that in such and such a village or town is a woman or man sick or dead, but with his own eyes he sees such. Thereupon he is stirred, he feels agitation, etc. Just as monks, that good thoroughbred steed on having his coat pricked with a goat stick is stirred. Even so, using this figure, do I speak of this good thoroughbred man. This is the second sort. Then again, monks, here we may have a certain good thoroughbred man who does not hear it said, nor yet with his own eyes sees a woman or a man sick or dead, but his own kinsman or blood relation 
is afflicted or sick eh, or dead. Thereupon he is stirred, just as monks that good thoroughbred steed on having his flesh pierced is stirred. Even so, using this figure, do I speak of this good thoroughbred man. This is the third sort of good thoroughbred man. Once more, monks, here we may have a good thoroughbred man who neither hears it said, nor yet with his own eyes sees, nor is his own kinsman or blood relation sick or dead. But he himself is stricken with painful bodily feelings, grievous, sharp, racking, distracting, discomforting, that drain the life away. Thereat he is stirred, he feels agitation. Being so stirred, he strictly applies himself. Thus applied, he both realizes with his own person the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Just as monks, that good thoroughbred steed on being pierced to the very bone is stirred, feels agitation. Even so, using this figure, do I speak of this good thoroughbred man. Of such a sort, monks, is the good thoroughbred man in this case. This is the fourth sort. These monks are the four sorts of thoroughbreds among men found existing in the world. Uh, this uh, is quite a good sutta. It tells us uh, when uh, a person... Um, uh, is ready uh, to renounce uh, and cultivate the spiritual life. Uh. The first one is the best, uh, uh, the person because of past practice, uh, past practice of the holy life uh, and in the past life. Uh, so when he comes back to this human world, uh, he hears it said uh, that such and such a woman or a man uh, is sick or dead. Uh, just by hearing it, uh, he he sees impermanence, la. he realizes impermanence and dukkha. La. So he is moved uh, to renounce uh, and practice the holy life. Uh. Then he realizes the truth. If you look into the Theragata and the Therigata, the verses of the Arahans, uh, there are some uh, very gifted people, uh, very very special people, uh, some even seven-year-old child, you know, the Buddha sees that person straight away. The Buddha recognizes, you know, the Buddha uh, uh, persuades. Uh, and also because the parents allow, uh, then the Buddha tells his disciple uh, to quickly let this uh, young man go forth, uh, this young kid, uh, seven-year-old. He, and sometimes uh, they renounce in the morning, just shave the head in the morning. Uh, by the night, the person is already an arahan. You know? uh, such, uh, these are real thoroughbreds uh, among men because of past cultivation. Uh, so this one uh, is the first type. Uh, he just hears it said only uh, that uh, that a person is sick or dead, uh, and he feels agitated. And just like the Buddha, you know, but the Buddha falls into the second category. Uh. Second category is a person uh, who sees with his own eyes uh, a sick person or a dead person. Uh, uh, and then he is stirred, uh, and he wants to renounce and practice. Uh. That's why we see uh, that uh, the Buddha, he had such a... Uh, life of luxury when he was young. Uh, he had such a good life. Uh, and yet, uh, because of past cultivation, uh, past realization of the truths, uh, that's why I believe uh, personally that the Buddha was already an Arya, probably a Sotapanna or a Sakadagami from the previous life. You know, That's why when he was young, even from young, uh, he was not very interested in the worldly life. And in spite of being surrounded by female slaves and a lot of maids, etc., and uh, the Buddha said uh, in one of the suttas that during the winter or rainy season, uh, he would be left alone in his mansion, uh, surrounded by female slaves, uh, no men around, all female slaves to attend to him. So he had such uh, uh, sensual pleasures. Uh, uh, but in spite of all this, uh, his heart was not in the world, you know. So when he saw a sick man, a dead man, an old man, etc., he decided to renounce. Uh, so there's something from his memory sort of uh, stirring him. So that is the second type of person. The third one, uh, more people fall into this category. Uh, when somebody uh, whom you love very much uh, uh, is sick uh, or dead, uh, and it grieves you so much uh, that you want to renounce, either your uh, child or your your own child or your spouse, uh, your husband or wife or your father or mother, somebody very close to you, uh, brother or sister, uh, is sick or dead. Uh, 
and then uh, you decide to renounce. Uh. Then the fourth one is one uh, who, uh, even when the relative, close relative is sick uh, or dead, uh, he's not ready to renounce, but he himself uh, is stricken uh, with, a, with a dreadful disease, uh, uh, one uh, that uh, is, is draining his life away. Uh, for example, the person gets cancer. When you hear uh, that you have cancer, uh, that you know that your time is limited, uh, then uh, this person uh, might decide uh, to forget about the worldly uh, life uh, and renounce and cultivate. Uh. But then uh, there are many people uh, who are not thoroughbred uh, steeds uh, or thoroughbred men. Uh, and uh, even uh, when they themselves are sick uh, and afflicted with cancer, etc., they still don't think of renouncing. Uh, those are uh, very common people in the world. Uh, some people, uh, even on the deathbed, uh, they don't realize uh, that there is a path uh, out of samsara, that if they practice the holy path, uh, there is a way out of suffering. And because they have not uh, come across the Dhamma, they have not had the good fortune uh, of hearing the Dhamma. So even until the moment that they are dying away, uh, they are dying, uh, they are passing away, uh, they still uh, uh, don't have the thought uh, of cultivating the holy life eh, to get out of samsara, get out of the round of rebirths. Eh. Then we come to the next sutta, 4.12.114. Monks possessed of four qualities, a raja's elephant is worthy of the raja. A possession of the raja is reckoned an attribute of a raja. What are the four qualities? Here in monks, a raja's elephant is a listener, a destroyer, a bearer, a goer. And how monks is a raja's elephant a listener? In this case, monks, whatever task the trainer of elephants imposes on him, whether he has performed it before or not, the raja's elephant makes that his object, gives attention to it, considers it with all his mind, with ready ear listens thereto. Thus monks is a raja's elephant a listener. And how monks is a raja's elephant a destroyer? In this case, monks, a raja's elephant entering battle, destroys elephant and mahout, horse and rider, chariot and driver and footman. Thus is he a destroyer. And how monks is a raja's elephant a bearer? In this case, monks, a raja's elephant entering battle, bears the blows of spear, sword, arrow and axe, and also the din of drum and kettle drum, of conch, tam-tam and other noise. Thus he is a bearer. And how monks is a raja's elephant a goer? In this case, monks, a raja's elephant, in whatever direction the trainer of elephants turns him, whether he has gone there before or not, there he quickly goes. Thus he is a goer. So possessed of these four qualities, monks, a raja's elephant is worthy of the raja. A possession of the raja is reckoned an attribute of a raja. In like manner, monks, possessed of four qualities, a monk is worshipful, worthy of gifts and offerings, of salutations with clasped hands, a field of merit unsurpassed for the world. What for? Here in monks, a monk is a listener, a destroyer, a bearer and a goer. And how is a monk a listener? In this case, when Dhamma Vinaya is set forth by a Tathagata, a monk makes that his object, gives attention to it, considers it with all his mind, with ready ear listens to Dhamma. Thus is a monk a listener. And how is a monk a destroyer? In this case, a monk does not admit sensual thinking that has arisen. He abandons, restrains, makes an end of it, forces it not to recur. So also with regard to malicious thinking, cruel or harmful thinking, he does not admit evil unprofitable states that occur from time to time. He abandons them, restrains, makes an end of them, forces them not to recur. Thus he is a destroyer. And how is a monk a bearer? In this case, a, man, a monk bears heat, cold, hunger, thirst, contact of flies, mosquitoes, wind and sun and creeping things. He bears abusive, pain-causing ways of speech. He submits to painful bodily feelings, grievous, sharp, wrecking, distracting and discomforting that drain the life away. Thus is a monk a bearer. And how is a monk a goer? In this case, a monk quickly goes where in this long journey he has never gone before. 
namely to the tranquilization of the conditioners, sankara, to the forsaking of every basis of rebirth, to the destruction of craving, to passion, passionlessness, to ending, to nibbana. Thus is a monk a goer. Possessed of these four qualities, a monk is worshipful, worthy of gifts and offerings, of salutations with clasped hands, a field of merit unsurpassed for the world. In this sutta number 114, the Buddha compared a Raja's elephant to a monk. Uh, this is one of the suttas where the Buddha uses uh, this comparison of the Naga, an elephant with a monk. This word Naga denotes an elephant. It also means a uh, snake spirit, a uh, snake deva. A deva with a snake body. It also means is used for a great being, a noble person. In this sutta, the Buddha said that a raja uh, and an elephant is worthy of a raja if it possesses uh, four qualities, namely that it is a listener, a destroyer, a bearer, and a goer. And simil- similarly, if a monk possessed four qualities, then he is worshipful, worthy of gifts and offerings, worthy of salutations which clasp hands, a field of merit unsurpassed for the world. And these four qualities are that the monk is a listener, a destroyer, a bearer, and a goer. And the Buddha said, um, in this case, uh, being a listener means that the monk listens to Dhamma Vinaya, the teachings of the Buddha, the discourses and the disciplinary conduct, the disciplinary code set forth by the Buddha. And um, a Buddha's disciple is known as a Savaka. The Buddha called his disciples Savakas. Savaka means, uh, literally means a listener, a hearer one who listens to the Buddha's teachings. And so we can see that um, listening, uh, learning the Buddha's teachings is uh, very important. Another word that is mentioned uh, quite often in the discourses is Bahu Satcha, which means much learning. Uh, much learning means uh, much uh, learning of the Dhamma, Vinaya, and um, uh, which means uh, much knowledge of the teachings of the Buddha. So uh, this is one of the uh, much learning, uh, much knowledge of the Dhamma is one of the keystones, uh, foundation of the spiritual path. And the second quality is that the monk is a destroyer, which means that he destroys sensual thinking, malicious thinking, and cruel or harmful thinking. Uh, These are the wrong thoughts that should be destroyed by a monk. And the third is that the monk is a bearer. He bears heat and cold, hunger, thirst, contact with flies, mosquitoes, wind and sun creeping things. Uh, physical discomfort is to be expected for a renunciant and the Buddha always um, encouraged monks to go into seclusion to live up in the hills or in the forests or in caves etc. Uh, luxury is one of the obstacles to the spiritual path and it's uh, always discouraged by the Buddha. It is also mentioned here that uh, the monk submits to painful bodily feelings, grievous, sharp, racking, distracting and discomforting that drain the life away. So here we see that when uh, painful bodily uh, feelings arise which drain the life away, um, the monk is supposed to bear it, to continue to live to practice the holy life. Um, In other words, even uh, for anyone, if such feelings arise, um, it is better if we have not completed the goal, the aim of the holy life, that we bear such uh, grievous pains and so that we can uh, continue to 
practice and try to achieve the aim of the holy life, which is the ending of the round of rebirths. And finally, the monk is a goer. He goes to where he's never been before in this long journey of samsara, the round of rebirths, namely to the ending of every basis for rebirth, the destruction of craving, to Nibbana. So possessed of these four qualities, such a monk is worthy of gifts and offerings, of salutations with clasped hands, a field of merit unsurpassed for the world. Now we come to Sutta number 4.12.115. The Buddha said, Monks, there are these four occasions. What for? There is, monks, the occasion when action is unpleasant and unprofitable to the doer. That when action is unpleasant but profitable to the doer. That when action is pleasant but unprofitable to the doer and the occasion when action is both pleasant and profitable to the doer. Now monks, in the first case, in a case when action is both unpleasant and unprofitable to the doer, one deems action inadvisable for both reasons, for it is both unpleasant and unprofitable. Then again, in the second instance, that is when action is unpleasant but profitable, one may know who is a fool and who a wise man in the matter of manly strength, manly vigor and energy. For monks, the fool has no such consideration as this. Though this is an occasion when action is unpleasant, yet it is one which brings profit. Accordingly, he does not act and his inaction brings him loss. But the wise man... Thus considers, though this is an occasion when action is unpleasant, yet it brings profit to the doer. Accordingly, he acts and profit results. Now in the third case, when action is pleasant but unprofitable, in this case also one may know who is a fool and who a wise man in the matter of manly strength, manly vigor and energy. For monks, the fool does not thus consider, though this act is pleasant, yet it brings loss. Accordingly, he acts, and the result is loss. Whereas the wise man thus reflects, though this act is pleasant, yet its results bring loss. So he acts not, and the result is to his profit. Lastly, monks, in the case where action is both pleasant and profitable, one deems action advisable for both reasons, for it is both pleasant and profitable. That is why one deems action advisable. So these are the four occasions of action. Now these four occasions uh, the Buddha mentioned. Uh, the first one when action is unpleasant and unprofitable uh, is, for example, the case of the unbeneficial ascetic practices. Uh, during the Buddha's time you had... Uh, some uh, external ascetics uh, which practice all kinds of unbeneficial practices uh, like starving themselves, behaving like an animal, uh, limiting their diet, etc., uh, etc., et which, uh, which is unprofitable and unpleasant. So that should be avoided. The second case uh, is when action is unpleasant but profitable. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, say like uh, in the worldly sense, it could be like when a person uh, works for his uh, living, uh, then um, it might be unpleasant, but um, he's hardworking. Uh, and because he's hardworking and he pleases the boss, uh, then uh, he's rewarded for it. Uh. Or, for example, a wife may please the husband, uh, etc., and that is uh, in the worldly sense. Lah. In the spiritual sense, it's like learning to keep the precepts, eh? learning to meditate, learning to restrain oneself from unwholesome karma, 
uh, all these uh, in the beginning for a beginner uh, on the uh, spiritual path uh, all these are difficult even learning to meditate is difficult uh, and so it is a little unpleasant but because the, it is profitable uh, then uh, we should do it uh. so in this case the buddha said you can distinguish a wise man from a fool uh, in this case uh. Because a fool, uh, just because it is unpleasant, he would want, not want to do it. Uh, he will be lazy. Uh. And the third case uh, is when action is pleasant but unprofitable. In these cases, it is like uh, gambling uh, is uh, pleasant but unprofitable. Drinking, womanizing, uh, even hunting, f- fishing, uh, being addicted to TV and video shows, etc. All these are pleasant activities, but it is unprofitable. And so, in this case also, the Buddha said you can distinguish a fool from a wise man. Huh? A wise man would not do uh, these things because it is unprofitable. Huh? Uh, and then in the last case is when action is both pleasant and profitable. Uh, for example, like uh, when a, a person has attained... Uh, samadhi concentration and he abides in samadhi enjoys the bliss of jhana uh, this is not discouraged by the buddha in fact the buddha said it should be pursued developed and made much of it is not to be feared why because it gives you the attainment of sotapanna sakadagamin anagamin and arahanhood this is mentioned in the majjhima nikaya and diga nikaya so Ah, these are the different types of actions. Eh? Now we come to 4.12.118. The Buddha said, Monks, these four places are to be looked upon by a believing clansman with feelings of emotion. What for? At the thought, here the Tathagata was born. The believing clansman should look with feelings of emotion. At the thought, here the Tathagata was enlightened with supreme enlightenment. The believing clansman should look with feelings of emotion. At the thought, here the Tathagata sat rolling the supreme Dharma wheel. The believing clansman should look with feelings of emotion. At the thought, here the Tathagata was utterly released in the Nibbana state, wherein no basis remains behind. The believing clansman should look with feelings of emotion. These are the four places. And this sutta ref- refers to the four holy places uh, in India, which uh, Buddhists uh, like to make a pilgrimage to. Uh, the first one where the Buddha was born, that is at Lumbini. And now I think they have decided Lumbini is in Nepal. Uh. And the second one where the Buddha was enlightened is Bodhigaya. Bodhigaya. And the third one, where the Buddha sat rolling the Dharma wheel, started to teach the Dharma, that is in a place formerly called Isi Patana. I think now it's called Saranath. Saranath. And then the last place is where the Buddha entered Parinibbana. Uh, that's the place called Kusinara. So if you have the opportunity, I should... Uh, It'd be good to visit the holy places in India.